To avoid unwanted YouTube ads, we encourage you to watch this video via the link in the video description below. May God bless you today. So thankful that you've joined us this morning as we gather here at Awake for worship and praise, for reflecting on God's Word, for giving Him adoration and thanks for all He has done and all He is. Today, we continue in a series entitled Rescued by Truth. And the title of today's message is Well Dressed. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, Chris, that is a really strange title for a message. Do you mean that God is into clothes choices? Hang on to that for a second, okay? We're going to come around to it in just a few moments. But first of all, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and adoration. We thank you that you are our creator. We rejoice that you have saved us through the death and resurrection of your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we praise you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who dwells in the hearts of all of us who believe. May you be honored today. May we be encouraged, convicted, blessed, and strengthened as we reflect upon your word and as we apply that word to our lives. Pray this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Well, let's talk about being well-dressed, shall we? You know, first of all, styles have changed dramatically over the years. I'd like to give you an illustration of that from my own life. This is a, a book that... Uh, has been in a box somewhere down in our basement for quite a while now. But it's a book that I vividly remember both buying and reading years ago. Over 40 years ago, by the way. It's entitled Dress for Success. The number one book to make you look like a million so you can make a million. The short version of this is, if you're a guy, navy blue suit, white shirt, red tie. It was extremely popular in the 1970s and into the 1980s. And then along came business casual. And all of a sudden that look wasn't quite so desirable anymore. And after that, just recently, came this. Zoom meetings. And all of a sudden jokes abounded about people who looked good from the waist up for the Zoom meeting but we're wearing pajamas underneath the table. Styles have changed. They've changed remarkably. But there is one thing that has never gone out of style. And it's not that God has a particular way he wants us to dress, but God does indeed desire that we dress in a very specific manner. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote. He said, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. If you want to know what God's direction is for proper dress among believers, you can't go wrong with Colossians 3, verse 12. And so today, we're going to be taking a look at that section of Scripture. We're going to be applying it very directly to our lives. We're going to continue taking a look at what the Scripture says about clothing ourselves with the virtues that God desires in the life of all of us who believe. And we're also going to look at that from the vantage point of truth number two, the truth that we started considering last week, and we're going to continue this week and next week as well. Truth number two, my life is about God's plan for me. My life is about God's plan for me. God's desire is not only to save us, but to use us, to mold, to shape, to transform, to renew us, to give us purpose, direction, joy, strength, and the ability to persevere even in the face of the difficult days in these last days. My life is about God's plan for me. And that entails things that I want to add in my life, according to the scriptures, as well as things I want to remove from my life, according to the scriptures. We're going to concentrate on the adding today. And as we do that, and as we take a look, at Colossians 3, verse 12. I'd like to begin 
by talking about three very important truths that come in this short little verse before anything is even said about clothing yourselves with things like identity, motive, and power. Before we talk about proper dress for a believer, it's very important that we talk about our identity, our motives, and the power. And so on that note, let's begin with identity. What do we read in Colossians 3 verse 12? It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, what is your identity and mine if you were a follower of Jesus Christ? And the answer from scripture is, we are God's chosen people. We belong to him. He chose us even before we were born. He gave his son for us. We are his chosen people. And that changes the trajectory of our lives because we're no longer living simply for ourselves. We're living for God. More than that, we understand who God says we are. You know, the enemy loves to tell us that we're failures, loves to tell us we need to work a little harder, loves to tell us, oh, you've accomplished so much, that the enemy loves to either puff us up or totally deflate us. That's the way the devil works. But God says we need to understand our identity from his eyes because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because God took on human flesh and moved among us, because Jesus willingly went to the cross to pay for our sins with his own innocent blood, because he is risen from the grave, because he is at the Father's right hand and is coming back soon. Our identity, our identity revolves around him. And we are God's chosen people. When the heavenly Father looks at you and at me, he sees the goodness and perfection of Christ Jesus. That's our identity. And the enemy cannot steal that away. We need to keep that in mind because in that, in our identity, comes direction for life as well. Therefore, as God's chosen people, the Apostle Paul says, before he talks about clothing with anything, he speaks about identity. And he speaks about something else, and that is motive. What is our motive? for clothing ourselves with the virtues of God? What is our motive for life? And the answer is also found in the opening words of Colossians 3, verse 12. The motive is this, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, holy, set apart, set apart for service to God. What is our motive for living the Christian life? It's not so that others will look at us and be impressed. It's not so that we will feel good about ourselves. It's not so we will avoid certain difficulties. It's not so we can continue to abide by particular motives and actions and uh, values that we were taught as kids. Our motive is we've been chosen by God and set apart as holy set apart for his service, set apart for him. Everything we do comes back to God. He's the one who made us. He's the one who saved us. He is the one who fills us with his Holy Spirit. Our motive is to give him glory. What is your purpose and motive in life? If it's not to glorify God, it needs to change. Our motive revolves around the fact that he has declared us not just to be his chosen people, but his holy servants set apart for his glory and his service. That's profound stuff. And that is powerful and effective. And it leads us then to the third item that Paul talks about. And that is power, power. The apostle writes, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, love 
is power. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. In that is the power of forgiveness. God so loved the world that he not only gave his only son for us all, but through the resurrection of Jesus and because of his ascension, as Jesus promised, he pours out the Holy Spirit upon us. And that's where power is found. It's not found in our own strength. It's not found in our own abilities. It is found in God. It is found in the fact that we are dearly loved by him and he provides everything we need for our life in him and for this life and for the life to come. Power. God gives us our identity. God is the one who changes our motives. And God is the one who imbues us with power, supernatural, divine power. And having said all of that, the Apostle Paul now moves on. And he goes and tells us about being well-dressed. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Note that clothe yourselves, put it on. Every day, you and I are called to put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That is the way we reflect the goodness of God. When we get up in the morning, we change out of our pajamas and get into our work clothes. For a believer, every morning when we rise, we resolve by God's grace, by His strength, because our identity is found as His chosen people, because our motive is that we are holy people set apart by Him, and because our power is found in Him and His Holy Spirit, we resolve to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Think about those things for a second. You know, we are living in a world and in a culture that is increasingly hostile toward Christianity and toward the message of the biblical faith. It has always been important to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. But it has never been more important to do that as it is now. Because we live in a world that is increasingly ignorant of what the biblical faith is all about. And if what they see in us is simply judgmentalism, it will in no way be convicting. If instead they see in us the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. When I read those words, I am immediately taken to the Lord Jesus himself because that's the way he lived. Compassion is seen in our Lord Jesus who has compassion upon the weak upon those who are rejected by the rest of society, an individual who didn't hesitate to embrace a leper and give hope to a prostitute. Jesus is above all compassionate. We see it throughout his ministry and life and even individuals who have rejected the biblical faith when they read or hear or see what Jesus is like it causes them to pause and reflect, this isn't what I was expecting. Compassion goes a long way and so does kindness. The kind of kindness that we see in the Lord Jesus himself. You know, Jesus began his, his ministry at a wedding and we see incredible kindness there. It was profound, it was prophetic kindness, but it was kindness. He bailed out a bride and groom who could have been thoroughly embarrassed by running out of wine at this big shindig that was the most important day of their lives. Jesus shows kindness. He also shows humility. He is humble. He is gentle. Come to me, all of you who are weak and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest, he says. Take my yoke upon you because I am gentle 
and humble of heart. When we see these words, they lead us back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they remind us that our call is to reflect him in our lives. The kind of gentleness that he shows with those in desperate need and the kind of patience he put up with us. <laughs> Let's just be real honest. He came to that which was his own, the apostle John writes, but his own did not receive him. Yet he did not, he did not call down fire from heaven. He instead took the wrath of the heavenly father. He did not say, I've had it with you people, you're toast. He said, I've come to rescue you. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. When we see our Lord Jesus, we see the very virtues that the Apostle Paul talks about here as he calls us to clothe ourselves with those kind of godly virtues. That's Colossians 3, verse 12. Paul didn't stop there. He goes on in the next verse to remind us to forgive one another. How important that is. That as believers, we not only forgive our enemies, we forgive our brothers and sisters. But then he adds this note, verse 14. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Put on love. That is not a bromide. That is not just a, uh, a word that's set in today. True love is sacrificial according to the Bible. How does God show love? He gives his only son. How does the Lord Jesus show love? He dies for us. Love is costly. Love is self-sacrificing. Love is difficult. But when genuine love is shown, it binds all the other things together in perfect unity. And again, how important that is for today. We're living in a culture that says, you've got to tolerate everything. And as believers, that puts us in a very difficult position because there are things we do not want to tolerate in our lives. There are things we do not want to condone. But above all else, we want to love. Josh McDowell, who uh, as a young man was actually an agnostic, planned to be a lawyer, had nothing to do with Christianity, and then was challenged to take a look at the evidences for the biblical faith. It changed his life. Josh McDowell has traveled around the world. He has spoken to millions of people. He's now in his 80s. He's written over 140 books. And a number of years ago, he wrote these words that I think are especially applicable to our culture today, to the time in which we live, and to God's call to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness, humility and gentleness, and over all these things put on love. This is what McDowell wrote. He said, Tolerance says, you must approve of what I do. Love responds, I must do something harder. I will love you even when your behavior offends me. Tolerance says, you must agree with me. Love says, I must do something harder. I will tell you the truth because I'm convinced the truth will set you free. Tolerance says, you must allow me to have my own way. Love responds, I must do something harder. I will plead with you to follow the right way because I believe you are worth the risk. Tolerance seeks to be inoffensive. Love takes risks. Tolerance glorifies division. Love seeks unity. Tolerance costs nothing. Love costs everything. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, 
clothe yourselves. And over all these things, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. May God grant that in your life and in mine, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, our desire is not to impress others with our clothing, but rather to glorify you with our character, with our lives, with our witness. Teach us daily to clothe ourselves with kindness and compassion, with humility and gentleness. Teach us above all else, Lord, to bind these things together with your divine, purposeful, sacrificial love. May Jesus be glorified. May others be drawn to you. And above all else, may you be praised. Amen. Let's talk about these things, shall we? Just to get the discussion started, a few things. First of all, do you see yourself as God sees you? That's so important. We need to reject what the enemy says about us. We need to see ourselves as God sees us, as precious in his sight, individuals for whom he died. Even when our lives don't measure up, it is especially important to realize where our identity is found. And so why is it essential to base your identity on what God says about you? Because if you try to do things on your own, where are you gonna end up? And so by faith in Christ Jesus, what do you need to put on daily? What are the things that the Holy Spirit is laying upon your heart today where he is gently nudging you or maybe even yelling in your ear? Here are the things that you need to do as an act of faith to give glory to your heavenly Father and to magnify the name of Jesus.